Thanks so much for inviting me, first of all, uh, not only because I do like to be in nature, but uh, because it's been really great to hear the conversations going on and uh, the energy here, and it's hugely valuable for me to be able to meet people and find out what's going on, and uh, so I really value the opportunity. Um, so I was asked to talk about what I see as, as main trends in emerging technology, which is um, a challenge because I feel like I'm talking to a room full of people who know a lot about <laughs> emerging trends and technology. Uh, I'm definitely not an expert, but on my show Spark, I do get to talk to an amazing number of innovators. Um, and really what I focus on is what I would call technologically driven change. So where social trends meet technological trends. So I'm coming at this from maybe a slightly different angle. Uh, I suspect that the trends that I list are things you're probably gonna be familiar with, but I'm hoping to tease out what I think some of the implications are. And so when I was thinking about what I was going to talk about, I found myself remembering a story that we covered on uh, Spark recently that I think is kind of the governing model for the trends I'm going to talk about. It was a story of these two high school chemistry teachers in rural Colorado who came up with this clever idea. Instead of bringing the students together in the classroom for a lecture and then assigning them their homework to do uh, you know, in their bedrooms in the evenings, they decided to flip the model of the classroom and homework on its head. So they made video podcasts of their lectures, which they assigned as homework. Uh, and in the, in the school time, what they used to have as a lecture, that's what they did their homework in with the teacher, and they worked collaboratively with other people. So it's been tremendously effective for them, and uh, the effect was immediate and obvious. And here's a little bit about one, what one of the teachers had to say about it. Normally, it would take us a couple weeks to get to know the students and to, to figure out who is really struggling with the material and who is getting it. But with this model, now instead of me spending so much time in front, I'm now with my students. I, I speak to every single student every single day, and I talk to them. What, how are you doing? What don't you understand? So they're getting a lot more. Could you hear that? Yeah, OK, <laughs> good. <laughs> Um, now, although they lived in rural uh, Colorado, where high-speed internet was not available everywhere, between downloads to phones and MP3 players, flash drives and DVDs, every one of their students was able to watch the lectures. So there's nothing particularly cutting edge about video podcasts. Why am I telling you this? Um, what I think is that we know a lot about access to the technology. But I think we're only starting to kind of drill down a little bit to see beyond the technology itself, to see what the changing technology means at a deeper cultural level. I mean, so many of our ideas of social organization, the way we educate, the way we work, the way we play, the way we date, are based on the problem of scarcity of access to information. So what happens if that scarcity of access to information no longer exists? Why does it seem natural to us to have a lecture in the classroom and do homework at home? Well, because the structure of a classroom came about during a time when you had to be physically in the same room as the teacher in order to get the information. And so, you know, I think we've become very good at figuring out what the technology can do, but we haven't dug down to say, what are the unquestioned assumptions about how we live and relate to each other that are based on a scarcity of information that doesn't need to exist any longer? I mean, in the Colorado case, we see a whole structure of the way a class is organized turned on its head because two teachers were able to make that kind of conceptual shift. So as I go through some of the main uh, technological trends, there are two questions that you might want to keep in mind. One is, how is a trend a result of a new lack of scarcity of information? And two, is there a conceptual shift in how we organize, learn, or socialize that that technological change opens up? And how can I take advantage of that? Because that's the space where innovation really lives. I mean, there's the one level of innovation of the technological change. The other level is making those conceptual shifts. Uh, so, you know, now like any journalist, I'm a magpie and I have a lot more questions than answers. Most of what I've done here is basically pick up on things that guests of my show, Spark, have uh, pointed out and tried to see where they fit together in bigger patterns. So this idea of the end of scarcity of information, for instance, turns up in a lot of different theories. Um, you know, Chris Anderson talks about the economics of free. Seth Godin's talk about, talked about a shortage of scarcity. Nick Carr, in his excellent book, The Big Switch, calls it the new economics of culture. It turns up in conversations about open source approaches to production, in pro-am culture, in crowdsourcing. So what we're really talking about is a deep shift that lies underneath all these different technological changes. Um, and a caveat, 
I know I'm making a lot of caveats before we get started, but a caveat here is that I know that uh, here and abroad, obviously, there are huge challenges that still exist in terms of access to information, technical challenges, financial challenges around income disparity, policy challenges. So I don't want to seem like a Pollyanna about the end of scarcity of information, but um, I am nonetheless optimistic. So let's start with a simple trend that I think we, nobody is going to disagree with, uh, the mobile web. Uh, at the recent Lift Asia conference, Adam Greenfield from Nokia used the great expression mobiquity to talk about the near future of being continually connected in a mobile way. Um, and I think the, the interesting thing to think about with the mobile web is uh, thinking about this as a truly international technology. Uh, there are 3 billion cell phones in the world right now. 73 million people in China alone access the web only on their phones. Um, and in The Economist's latest technology quarterly, which just came out a couple of weeks ago, they asked the question, as more people in the world access the internet through their phones rather than through desktop computers, what does that mean for innovation? There is, after all, a reason that Google is partnering with cell phone makers to make the Google phone. Um, so what happens when uh, the mobile web becomes a much more internationalized phenomenon? And I think one of the things we have to ask ourselves is, we often forget that technology is really cultural and that it's got politics uh, hidden in it. And when we forget the cultural components, we forget that technology is different in different places. And that when technology becomes international, that opens up whole other opportunities and whole other challenges. So just to use a very simple example of, of the cell phone and uh, text messaging uh, and the internationalization, internationalization of phones, um, you can look at a country like uh, Kenya, right, where cell phones are adapted so that they can transfer money. People use their phone uh, payment cards to pay for electricity. They have all kinds of applications um, because there are lots of people who don't have bank accounts, and so they use the cell phone application in that sort of way. And that's not a way of thinking about designing cell phones that would necessarily occur to you unless you're aware of the different cultural impacts of how technology is used in different locations. So the mobile web is a simple concept for all of us, a simple place to start, um, but it connects to a broader technological shift, which I have just been calling by the inelegant but sort of Star Trek-y name of the virtual meeting the real. So if the web of the 1990s was about anonymity and aliases and globalism where uh, location didn't matter, um, increasingly uh, we are starting to layer the world around us with digital information, which is a spin-off of the mobile web. Um, creating a sort of middle world between online and offline. And we're starting to see all kinds of cool projects uh, and startups. Like um, recently, I just heard about um, TikiTag. Has anybody heard of this? This is an Alcatel Lucent project that's going into beta uh, tomorrow, I think. Um, and from what I s can see, it's kind of like a post it note type of interface that you know, uh, is sort of encoded with digital, bits of digital information that you can sort of stick on objects around you. Um, Japan has just launched tests of smart posters, so RFID-like technology that allows di digital information on posters to be transferred to your cell phone. So there are all kinds of ways in which we're seeing digitally encoded information into the world around us. This is a so-called Internet of Things that we've been hearing about forever. All of which just makes me think of William Gibson's expression about uh, the future is already here, it just isn't evenly distributed. And the flip side of digital information encoded in the world around us would be something like the annotations that we're starting to see in Google Earth, where real-world uh, geotagged information, location-based information, is plotted to Google Earth locations. So what happens when we have perpetual internet connectivity with devices that are GPS-enabled and know where they are? Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a moment, but needless to say, there are going to be some hiccups along the road as we start to see these two layers of online and offline kind of um, merging. And just to use a simple example, lots of cars and trucks are GPS enabled, obviously, and have mapping tools to suggest the most efficient route from A to B. And last season on Spark, we heard about a story about a tiny historic English village called Wedmore that was having some trouble because of GPS enabled uh, large trucks. Um, it turns out that mapping uh, sources couldn't tell that giant trucks shouldn't go through tiny villages. So here's a little bit of the head of the parish council of the tiny village of uh, Wedmore. His name is uh, John Sanderson. Oops. That's not John Sanderson, that's uh, Harry Belafonte. Some of these uh, large 
large vehicles are getting stuck on, on the right angle bends. Uh, they've been caught uh, stuck down tracks, and we've had to, on, on some occasions, had farm tractors to pull them out. There's uh, an old lady opposite our church who gets her. Uh, Drivers say. I mean, if they get sort of stuck on a on a right angle bend, what do they say when you when you talk to them? Well, many of them. Normally, it would apologetic. take us a couple of weeks to get to know the students and to, to. There must be some kind of rule when you're doing a presentation about technology that the technology just never works properly. Uh, so, okay, so John Sanderson uh, explains the problem of the gigantic trucks roaring through his tiny village of Wedmore. Um, and what's the conceptual shift here? The question is to ask, what are the social organizations, the ways of doing business, that were built on the idea of not having information available to you when you're in the real world? Uh, that in the future, we need not worry about because our immediate walkable environment will be... Oh, thank you. you just turn that That'll work there. better than... Yeah. Well, it has to work better than what I tried before. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah, the conceptual shift being uh, what happens when we now have access to all this real world information and what are the other kinds of information that we still need to get by being out in the real world? Because again, that's where innovation happens once we realize what those con conceptual shifts uh, are that we need to, to move into. So a third and related trend is what I'm calling the return of uh, the hyper-local which is related to this idea of uh, information everywhere. And what happens when location-aware devices can send geotagged info to the web, which obviously we can already do. So we're starting to see web services pop up that specifically use the number crunching power uh, in the context of the local. And crime maps are a really good example of where this kind of thing is being implemented socially. The Home Office in the UK uh, has taken up an initiative to have crime maps of localized areas. Uh, and once we have data tagged with location, we can create all kinds of new information. So recently I interviewed uh, the geek productivity guru, uh, Gina Trapani. Does anyone use the like Lifehacker uh, blog? She runs Lifehacker. And she's recently been asked to try, try out the Flickr bike, which is this very cool bike that they have. Um, basically, it has a solar panel on the back of it, which powers a, uh, a cell phone camera that sits on the handlebars uh, a GPS-enabled cell phone camera that sits on the handlebars, and every 60 seconds it takes a picture of whatever is going on, you know, wherever you're riding the bike, and automatically uploads it to Gina's um, Flickr account, and it's mapped uh, on a map of, you know, where she might be riding her bike. So you can actually go and take a look at, oh, then there's where Gina took her bike ride and stuff. And it may, it may seem like a silly application, but once we start to think more broadly of what that means when we connect, can connect um, geotagged information with the web, we can think of all s sorts of information and how all sorts of ways that we can use this and how actually it really facilitates a hyper-local existence rather than the idea of the web as, as global, as international, as anonymous. It facilitates uh, a web which is much more localized and much more sensitive to local uh, contexts. So an example of this uh, would be the way that we can use something like geotagging to build smarter communities. Uh, Carlo Ratti, who's a researcher at uh, MIT, he's just one example, but there are lots of people do, working in this kind of area. He and his team created this huge map recently in downtown Rome on the night of an all-night art event. And what they did was, just by using the very general information of where people were in relation to the cell phone towers all around them, he created this huge map that ran all night in downtown Rome that showed basically where crowds of people were in downtown Rome, and so you could imagine, oh, that's where a really hot art event is, or that's where a popular cafe is, or I just want to go home, so I'm going to avoid where the crowds are, and so on. So if we start to think about all the ways that we can create a more dynamic city by using all that information that, um, that we can get from uh, what's called reality mining, from you know, the, the passive data trails that we leave, we can start to think about ways that we can create more um, more sophisticated, more responsive communities, communities that um, can move where people are, that can supply services in a much more dynamic way. Of course, there are some caveats and concerns that go along with this idea of location-aware, mappable information. One of those is obviously going to be privacy-related. Pri privacy um, you know, how do we manage who knows where we are when? Um, I have talked to a number of sort of people who are doing work in this area who all say they think that there's 
room to grow in terms of giving people the opportunity to manage the portfolio of their, their data, their location-sensitive data, so that people can have a confidence about who they're sharing their information with uh, when. And also in terms of innovation, what are the kinds of things that can't be virtualized that we still really need to be out in the street to experience rather than looking at a map of our neighborhood? Um, you know, one thing that occurs to me in this sense about the consequences for this hyper-local mapped world is that it takes a lot of happenstance out of the experience of being in a city. Um, for instance, where, where I live in Toronto, uh, like a lot of cities, they've recently started farmer's market uh, days on different days on different parts of the city. And a couple of Sundays ago, I thought I'd go pick up some eggs because the egg seller had been there on previous weeks. And when I got to the market, she wasn't there, but I ended up having a great time anyway. And you know, bought a lot of other things that I wouldn't otherwise have got. But in a fully tricked out hyper-local world, I would have been able to go there and see that, oh, she's not there, there are no eggs there, and I would never have gone and I would ne never have had that experience. So just being able to have all that awareness of data it has a lot of upsides, but there are also a lot of downsides in terms of how we enjoy socializing with, with each other in the real world. Um, and I do think that all this idea of the, the hyper-localism of the web is tied into a more general social trend just towards the return of localism. People sometimes call this the still-made-here idea, that in spite of the fact that uh, you know, we import, obviously, lots of goods from all over the world, that there's a little bit of a shift back um, towards the return of the local. And trend watchers talk about things like the impact of rising fuel prices, uh, environmental concerns about carbon footprints, and so on and that have people concerned about sort of the provenance of their goods and trying to know where their goods come from. Um, and that there might be a little bit of bite back in terms of wanting things to be hyper-local and when, once we have the tools to do this, to tell us digitally the provenance of our goods, that there's going to be an appetite for that. Um, having said that, though, I'm a firm believer in the idea that whenever there's a trend, there's always a counter trend at the same time. So. Um, Certainly at the same time as I think we're seeing a rise of this hyperlocalism, there's also uh, a continuing trend towards uh, outsourcing. And this is something that I would actually call outsourcing uh, 2.0. Now, outsourcing obviously has been going on for a long time. And while there may be a new push for real physical goods to be produced and consumed locally, virtual goods will con continue to be made anywhere and everywhere in more sophisticated ways. We only have to remember Paul Strong's conversation uh, yesterday morning about the ways in which cloud computing facilitates uh, virtual production going on anywhere. But an interesting example of this idea of outsourcing 2.0 uh, I came across when I interviewed Anand Girdardas, who's a journalist with the New York Times. Um, and he's identified what he sees as a shift in the Indian model of outsourcing that I'm just sort of calling outsourcing 2.0. And he says that as other countries compete with India for outsourced work, India's high-tech sector is starting to become not just an outsourcer, but a broker of work. That is, what they're moving into is an economy of analyzing work processes, breaking them down into discrete parts, and farming them out to wherever the task can be done most effectively and least expensively. And if I can get this to work properly, here's Anand with one um, pretty compelling example. There was an American bank that wanted to create loan products for Hispanics. Now, this required a website that was in Spanish. Now, Indians would not be the ideal people to do this. Right. Probably. So you'd think they'd go to an American company with a Mexican operation or a Mexican company or something like that. What instead happened is they hired an Indian company in Bangalore, which in turn had an office in Monterey, Mexico. Think about this. This means an American bank sends work to India. The Indians send the work to Mexico, right. the work is returned to the Indians and returned to the, the Americans. And Americans are hiring a company well, saying that uh, large vehicles are getting stuck on, on the... <laughs> Me and technology. Um, so the question becomes not how do we outsource more or how do we virtualize, but what are the things that are best virtualized and what are the things that are best um, continuing to be local and taking advantage of these opportunities of hyper-localism? Uh, another emerging trend, again, will come as no surprise to you, um, which is sustainability. Obviously, we're hearing a lot about, and we'll hear more today, about the greening of IT. It's a huge, huge trend in architecture, uh, industrial design, and so on. But um, specifically, I like to talk about the intersection of sustainability with this idea that I'm talking about 
of freely available information because I think what that access to information does is it opens up whole new channels for production and distribution rather than just conserving energy or conserving resources. And again, uh, this is where innovation happens. You have that penny drop moment where you realize that a technological change means that you don't have to do things in the way that you have been doing them. Um, and a great example of this is what uh, green thinkers like Alex Steffen from worldchanging.com have as a great insight. And I'm not even going to play that. I'm just going to paraphrase what he said. Uh, what, he, what he told me was that, um, take the example of a power drill, OK? The average person uses the power drill that they own anywhere between 6 to 20 minutes over the life of the power drill. And yet we've all spent all this money, consumed all these resources, in order to have these objects sitting in our house that we, ne we don't really use. What we really want is the ability to make a hole in the wall when we want to make a hole in the wall. And that is a sort of conceptual shift uh, in terms of thinking about uh, how we get access to goods and services. And once you have this lack of scarcity of information, I mean, there have always been sort of tool libraries and tool exchanges, but once you have things like uh, lots of hyperlocal information available, you can suddenly make it conceivable for people to find out very easily, how do I get that drill exactly when I want it, where I want it, how do I reserve it simply, pick it up so it's, so it's very easy. Another example that he uses is the example of uh, auto sharing which, you know, people have always shared cars, but here's a case where, you know, with things like Zipcar and AutoShare, because you have this connection of hyper-local information on the web about where the nearest car is, because you have your web-enabled mobile device, suddenly that access to information means you can change the model of um, driving from buying a car to having drivability whenever I want to. So that's where the marriage of access to information um, and web-based services and sustainability all come together. Um, and another really cool case of this connection between sustainability, production models, and information uh, is a woman named Jennifer Vandermeer, who I just came across recently. She's a green activist and an innovation strategist, but she has a background as a Wall Street analyst. And she uh, has written recently about this gap in sustainability between what people say they want, which is sustainable design and green products, and what they actually purchase. So for example, more than 50% of consumers will say, yes, I want green household cleaners. But how many consumers actually buy green cleaners? About 5%. So how do you address that gap between pe what people say they want and what they actually uh, do? And her point is that you can only bridge that gap by working really closely with your consumers, and not just by having fo focus groups or polling people, because that's where you get numbers like 50%. Um, she's talking about applying um, open source principles of design to, in her case, products. But in this case, we're talking about a partnership between professionals and amateurs um, in terms of bringing your consumers closer to information so that you can better meet their needs, so that you can address things like sustainability. Um, a less explicitly green trend where this idea of getting your consumers close to information comes into play uh, is in mass customization, uh, which is another huge technologically driven trend that we're going to see more and more of. Um, so it's a good example of a technologically driven trend, but it's also a good example of um, new models of economic production. So we used to have the customized production of goods. You know, you go to the cobbler to get your shoe made, you go to a tailor to get your clothes made, and then we had the era of mass production, where identical goods were produced in gigantic production runs. But now what we're starting to see, because again, there's this lack of scarcity of information, you can bring consumers much closer to producers um, through access to information online. And you can start using the tools of mass production, but you can customize things much more to individual taste, thereby creating uh, a scarce and sought after good. So there's a case where the technological change of that access of information can again change production models just by realizing, okay, and just by asking the question really, well, what does it mean for my customers when I can bring them closer to, to what I'm doing, when I can uh, get get a closer relationship between the producer and the people who are using the end product of the goods. Um, my next trend, again, no surprise, uh, participatory culture. Obviously, we've all seen from the examples of social networking and Web 2.0 that access to the means of production and distribution means that people want to participate. 
the ability to respond to culture, to comment on it, to create it is spreading. Um, new statistics in Canada, for instance, suggest that the percentage of internet users with a personal web page has gone from 1% to 20% in just the last three years. Now, obviously, there, there are a lot of technical implications for the fact that people want to produce their own content. But really, the exciting and revolutionary question is what that participatory culture means in terms of the economy. Um, the media theorist Clay Shirky talks about this in his recent book, Here Comes Everybody, um, which is actually, it's a really excellent book. If uh, you haven't read it, I highly recommend it. And his point in part is that businesses that are built on the model of scarce goods that are no longer scarce, i.e. information, culture, uh, are going to have trouble in the coming economy, much in the way that the music industry has been floundering because it hasn't responded to the fact that their business model is busted. Um, and one of Clay Shir Shirky's examples of the challenges faced is the stock photo industry, where you know businesses were started because uh, you know businesses needed photographs um, for things like corporate documents and so on. But then once you have something like Flickr, where the cost of creating and storing information, in this case photographs, um, is very low or free when Creative Common li Commons licenses make photographs available to people. Um, it becomes problematic for the stock photo, photo industry where once scarce goods, photographs are no longer scarce. So the obvious question in this is how do you make money doing any of this? Um, and that of course is what many people, as I'm sure you know, are trying to sort out through the whole idea of the economics of free. Uh, and maybe there are actually alternative business models around giving stuff away for free. And the people behind the website TechDirt, for instance, uh, their concept is that, and I don't think they're unique in this, is that you just need to start charging for scarce goods and giving uh, non-scarce goods away for free. So the example in the music business would be that you accept that you can no longer make money by giving away al or by charging for albums because in a digital world the albums are no longer scarce. But you can charge for concerts. At least for now, they haven't figured out a way to clone live musicians. So we start this idea of marketing experiences, marketing goods that are scarce. Again, marketing goods that are hyper-local, that you need to be there in person for, rather than trying to continue to market things to people that are uh, cheap, abundant, or free. And I guess the corollary to all of that uh, participation economy and all of these new fabulous services and all this idea that people want to participate and create and custom design their sneakers and all of that is really who the hell has the time and energy to figure all this stuff out. And I think what uh, the innovations around social media and what some of the best Web 2.0 uh, apps really show us is that in fact lots of people have the desire and the appetite for participating in this stuff provided that it's simple, and uh, simplicity would be, I think, another uh, huge example um, of a trend that we're seeing a lot. And, and you know, just to use a very simple recent case, there are, what, hundreds of camcorders out there on the market, um, and what did everyone go suddenly berserk for in the last six months is the little cheap flip video camera that's completely simple to operate. Press one button, it starts recording, press the same button, it stops, open the attached USB port, stick it into your computer, you don't have to look at directions, you don't have to know anything about cameras or anything, you can just use it plainly, simply, automatically, the interface is totally transparent. And we're starting to see all of that coming forward in design, that idea of making things that are absolutely simple, where the barrier to using them are very low, because if we're going to expect people who are non-specialists to participate in all these things, they have to be uh, absolutely user-centered design, absolutely simple. And of course, this simplicity is so important to us because of the gigantic, monstrous hordes of information that exist all around us. I mean, admittedly, I work in the communications area, but I'm sure I'm not alone in feeling some days that, you know, a day's work involves blogging, moderating the blog, commenting the blog, uh, sending out the Twitter feed, answering emails on my show account, on my home account, answering the phone, et cetera, et cetera, all things that I have to do in addition to my actual job. So as we start to see more and more of this, um, we're going to see the proliferation of simple tools that allow us to be ambient, ambiently aware of what's going on around us and that are non-distracting, non-interruptive. So things like um, pervasive computing, somebody like Saul Greenberg could talk um, much more eloquently about this stuff than I could, um, but ways in which that we can manage all this data flows around us all the time. And we're starting to see even really exciting ways of displaying information in beautiful, artistic, 
formats that allow us to be aware of things without constantly being uh, distracted by them. And so, um, coming down to like maybe what I think is probably the most important shift in terms of sort of deeper social consequences is what I'm calling the socialization of knowledge. So when we look at the proliferation of all these tools of communication and information, it's not just that there's information that's readily available, more information than we used to have. It's that information and knowledge has become radically social. I mean, it's always been social in a way. There have always been, you know, university classes or um, peers that get together to talk about things, but now it's become much more democratized and much more radically social. So if we think about the way people use something like Twitter, for instance, how that's evolved in terms of people using it to point out links or to share breaking news with their friends or to put out a question to other people who are on their Twitter feed. Um, so now that idea of it's not what you know, it's who you know has a new resonance because the social relationships we make in social networking worlds are also information relationships. Um, and the corollary to that is that there's a very clear connection between social isolation and information isolation. And, you know, we can see how people who are adept at this kind of thing, I mean, think about yesterday afternoon when we had, you know, the demo camp and we talked about bar camp culture and stuff. This is an area where people who work in the knowledge sector have a lot of skill and a lot of ability to put together that kind of sharing of information in informal ways. But that's not a skill that's evenly dispersed across the community. And certainly it's not a skill that a lot of people are being educated in, you know, even now that we know, that's not the way I was educated, and even now that we know the world is changing this way, that's not the way most young people are, are being educated. So that, I think, in terms of how do we make the tools that make it easy for people to form those connections with each other um, without being overwhelmed by that access to information. So um, what are some of, the, some of the implications of all this? Um, obviously, if we're having this sort of broad economic and cultural shift because information isn't scarce and because it has all these tentacle-like um, elements to it from how we shop for groceries at our farmer's markets to how we produce sneakers um, to how we create more livable cities. Um, this whole idea of finding ways to organize, make it available, make information intuitive, simple, and collaborative is essential. Obviously, we're going to be more reliant than ever on um, uh, information technology and the greening of ICT is, is essential. Um, but I think that really what underlies it and, and what I keep coming back to is this idea that we're very good at observing technological change and creating technological change. But I'm reminded what, of what Marshall McLuhan said about technological change, that as long as we see those things as neutral, as not political, as not cultural, as not human, social, um, you know, we're going to engage in what he called the same banana skin pirouette and, colla and collapse. The technology is always going to take us surpri by surprise unless we really realize that it's social, that it's cultural, that it's human. Um, so I think where this leaves us really, because it's cultural and because it's human and because this is having such a huge shakeup, when we think about um, scarcity of information, we need to start talking about an ethics of, of information. Um, and what would that look like? Well, I think first of all, the digital divide becomes absolutely inexcusable. When you start to look at the gigantic cultural shakeups that lie underneath that, you know, it's not just talking about somebody's ability to watch a YouTube video. It's talking about all of these huge ways that the economy is being uh, reconfigured. That just, you know, we just can't have that digital divide in an era where access to information is having such a big impact. Um, it also means wrestling things like issues of copyright to the mat. We're starting to see that taking off in things like copyleft and creative commons but really getting a handle on how we protect intellectual property at the same time as we don't choke innovation. Um, and I think, you know, just really at a very simple human level, the idea of, uh, you know, good manners and, and teaching us all how to collaborate properly online is, a, is an important area in terms of articulating the ethics of media. Um, we're very far from equality in terms of access to information, but I think now we really are at this point where we have the opportunity to think more deeply about what a post-information scarcity world might look like and to start building for it right now in a way that's ethical, that's green, that's transparent, and that's responsible. 
And we can do that if we're able to shake off those conceptual blinders, if we're able to be like those two high school teachers in Colorado who saw beyond the technical to see what could be changed in the world around them. And uh, I look forward to seeing what you all come up with. Thank you very much.